We've been looking at the Word of God with a view to understanding the church. You, you might think it's pretty basic and pretty obvious what the church should be, but there are so many competing voices trying to define the church in cultural terms that it's good for us to go back and make sure we understand the foundation. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, th this gets down to some very important elements of life in the church. Many, many years ago when I was uh, very young in ministry here and trying to figure out just exactly what the Word of God said about the church and what the church should be, uh, I worked on, on developing a simple sort of list of things that were the non-negotiable realities in the life of the church. And uh, that has stood me in good stead for decades. And uh, I've never edited it, I've never altered it, I have never added to it, I have never subtracted from it. Uh, the, the most I have done is maybe reorganize it in a, in a different sequence. But all those things which were essential marks of a true church have remained the same because they come from the Word of God. And it's important for us to be reminded of the fact that as we saw when we began this uh, brief series, the Lord said, I'll build My church, and it's His church, He builds it His way, and we know that He has revealed on the pages of Scripture how He builds His church. Let me just give you a list, at least a partial list that we can begin to think about. What marks a true church? It begins with the absolute authority of Scripture. It begins with a commitment to the absolute authority of Scripture. The second thing that marks a church is a commitment to worship. It is God-centered. It is Christ-centered. It focuses outside itself on the one who is the object of worship. Thirdly, it is doctrinally clear. A church is a collection of the people of God who know what they believe. There's nothing vague about it. There's nothing wavering about it. There's, there's nothing uh, simplistic about it. It is clear, it is profound, and it is marked by strong conviction about what it believes. A fourth element that flows out of this in the life of the church is that it's marked by spiritual discernment. The church, the body of Christ, the people of God are able to look at the world and understand it. They have the capability to sort out the things that are happening all around them, both in the realm of the physical world as well as the spiritual. A true church is marked by discernment. Another characteristic of the true church is the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of holiness, true spirituality, not legalism, Christ-likeness. Another characteristic is submission to the divine will. Another characteristic is devotion to discipleship. Another characteristic is that it submits to a plurality of godly leaders. Another characteristic is mutual love. And another characteristic is consistent service, and another characteristic is passionate evangelism. Well, there, I gave you the whole list and we're done. <laughs> but that was only the introduction. I, I just want you to understand basically where I'm going to go with this. Uh, this is simply the list of things that I see as the foundational non-negotiables of the church. And inside of uh, those dozen that I gave you, there are all kinds of components and elements that I want to talk to you about. But I want to begin tonight with the first one, the first mark of the church is that it is devoted to the absolute authority of Scripture. A church has one authority one authority, and that is God rules, Christ rules in His church, and His will is disseminated in the church through the sole, single revelation from heaven, the Holy Scripture. Truth dominates the church. Truth defines the church. Divine truth, heavenly truth reigns over the church because the truth revealed in Scripture is the extension of and the revelation of the mind of God, of the mind of Christ. That's why 1 Corinthians 2.16 
says, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. This, this is what we come for. This is why we're here, because we want the truth. The truth gives life. We're begotten again by the truth. We're sanctified by the truth. We're comforted by the truth. We're given hope by the truth. Uh, we understand everything that we understand because we see it through the truth of the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It is written by men who were moved by the Holy Spirit and wrote down the very words of God. Paul commends the Thessalonians because when they heard the message that he preached, they heard it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. We know that. We understand that. We understand the mandate to preach the Word all the time, instant, in season, out of season, both in its negative rebukes and its positive affirmations. This is the priority of the church, the domination of the truth of Holy Scripture. What that means is that the preachers and the teachers in the church have the sole responsibility of proclaiming the Word of God. That's how God speaks in His church. That's how Christ exercises His headship and His leadership in the church. Now you know all of that, but what I want to do tonight is address the impact of that in the world in which we live, particularly in the world in which we are now living and uh, being rapidly submerged. I want you to understand that by sheer virtue of being totally devoted to the truth of God. We are an enemy force in the world. We cannot discharge that responsibility and at the same time be popular with the human system. And I want to show you why. First of all, I want you to look at John chapter 8 for a moment, John chapter 8, verses 44 and 45. And our Lord is speaking to the leaders in Israel, and He is identifying them as being children of the devil rather than children of God. But in verse 44 He says, "'You're of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father.'" Now th these are religious Jews, but anybody outside the true kingdom of God is a child of the devil doing the desires of the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me." That sets the church in direct opposition to the world. You have the family of God and the family of Satan. You have the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of God know the truth, proclaim the truth, live the truth of God. The rest of the world is dominated by the lies of Satan. There could not be a more obvious point of conflict. In Paul's instruction to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he says this, "'In case I am delayed, I write you,' he's giving Timothy instruction for ministry as a pastor of the church in Ephesus, "'I write you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. You need to know how to conduct yourself in the household of God along with everybody else, in the church of the living God, which is the pillar and support of the truth." That is a definition of the church that cannot be missed. The church of the living God is the stulos, the column, the support the pillar of the truth. We hold up the truth. Metaphorically, that word stulos is used of authority, specifically of authority. 
The church is the authority. The church speaks authoritatively. In uh, Galatians 2.9, recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, pillars in the church. There the word refers to men who are the apostles, who gave the apostles' doctrine which becomes the support of the church. The second word he uses here beside the word pillar is the word that NAS translates support. It's hedrioma. It means the foundation. Hedra means seat. Uh, it, it is the idea of being settled, seated, fixed, firm, steadfast. This then becomes the foundational definition of the church. It is the bastion of the truth of God. That is the church. It therefore is in absolute antipathy to everyone living outside the church. This has been pressed, I think, into bold relief in recent years in our country and in our world. There was a sense in which a, a biblical morality had prevailed in our nation for some centuries. That is long gone, as I told you a few weeks ago. There's a flow that you can see happening. First you abandon the Bible, then you create a new morality which is an immorality, then you demand tolerance, and for those who don't give you tolerance, you are intolerant and that leads to persecution. We're somewhere between intolerance and persecution. And that, in all honesty, is as it should be expected to be. Antipathy toward God, and this is something I want you to get. Antipathy toward God's truth resides in the heart of all sinners. Antipathy toward God's truth resides in the heart of all sinners. They resent the truth. They are part of the system of lies. Popular evangelicalism has, I think, as its biggest fear the idea that they will somehow be rejected by the culture. The only way you could not be rejected by the culture would be to lie about the truth or to hide the truth or to cover the truth or to compromise the truth. And then being bent on becoming the friend of the world, in the words of James, you have become the enemy of God. There are two kingdoms operating. Kingdom of God, the church with the truth, the kingdom of Satan, the world with lies. They are always on a collision course. I was being interviewed on, on, on the phone and the question was asked, what, what position is your church going to take on gay marriage, homosexual marriage? And I said, the biblical position, the biblical position. Marriage is between a man and a woman for life. Homosexuality is a sin, like a lot of other sins, but it is a sin. That's the biblical position. The question then followed, but what's your position? <laughs> My position. And why was I asked that? Because there's an old Anabaptist tradition. The old Anabaptist tradition bifurcated between one's personal and biblical opinion and one's social tolerances. What's your opinion about gay marriage? Should it be legalized or should it not? The Anabaptist view was, well, in the church we take the biblical position but we don't care about the society. In the church we take the view that the Word of God articulates, but in the world, since we're otherworldly. Since we're no part of that, we really don't care about that. I don't think that's a position a believer can take, or it terribly weakens the position that is biblical. I think we do care about gay marriage because people who live that way go to hell. We care about people living together in sin, as we heard earlier in a testimony, because people who continue in that lifestyle do not inherit the kingdom of God. We care about all of those iniquities, 
that alienate people from God and catapult them on their way to hell. So what is our view in the church toward gay marriage? The biblical view. What is our view in the society toward gay marriage? The biblical view. We, we don't allow it in the church, and we want everyone to know that it is a total disaster and a crime of epic proportions to allow it in the culture because it puts a stamp of approval on people who are living in a way that will send them to eternal punishment. We can only take one view. We can only take one view. We can't hide from the world in which we live. We are aliens and strangers here. We are in conflict with the system around us. We have to acknowledge that. And we can't have some kind of morality that we want in the church and not care how people live in the world. Of course we care how they live. We care that they continue in their sins, whether they're heterosexual sins or homosexual sins or any other kinds of sins. They damn people forever. The church can never be the friend of the world because friendship with the world is becoming an enemy of God. There has been, there always will be a fundamental, irreconcilable incompatibility between the church and the world, between the truth and the lie, between God and Satan. True gospel faith involves a denial of worldly values. Biblical truth contradicts the system of Satan. That is why Jesus said to His disciples the very night that uh, He was in the upper room with them, getting them ready for what they were going to face, He said, the world hates you. Why do they hate you? Because they hated Me. You are not of the world. I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But be of good cheer, He says in the next chapter, I have overcome the world. In fact, in Luke we read, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets, Luke 6, 26. False prophets want the world to speak well of them. Why? Because they want to gain popularity, notoriety, money. There is this fixed animosity between the truth of God and the world, and therefore between the church and the world. John 7, our Lord says, the world hates Me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Did you get that? The, the reason the world hates us is because we condemn its behavior. That generates hatred, animosity. Contempt for our convictions marks the world. Contempt for the gospel. And it's not because they, they, they don't buy the intellectual aspect of it. It's the sin, condemnation, judgment that they hate. Systematically, you're going to see over the months and years in the very near future, this hate reach the level of the powers that run the social and political systems of our nation. And you're going to see their animosity toward our view of premarital sex, extramarital sex, homosexuality, all of those things become so intolerable that laws are going to be made to come against us. What are we going to do? We have a fixed and established and eternal body of truth. We can't change anything. You're going to see, as you've already seen, churches and leaders 
who call themselves Christians make that sort of old Anabaptist distinction about, well, personally, and as somebody who's a Christian, I don't like it, but um, I think politically we have to allow it, which means inside the church we care about our theology, but we don't care if people go merrily on their way to hell outside. These are going to be very challenging days for us. Now, go back to my little list. The Bible has been totally rejected by the culture, by the power brokers. In the place of a biblical morality, they have put a morality they're comfortable with, which means an immorality has become the morality. Tolerance is demanded. Intolerance becomes a point of anger and hostility which leads to persecution. Still, as clearly as this distinction can be made, there will be churches, Christian leaders who will try somehow to make the world like them, thinking that that's how you win people. Listen, the only time the church has made any spiritual impact on the world is when the church has stood firm, uncompromising, unwavering, and boldly proclaimed the truth right into the face of the enemy. It's what the prophets did, and they were killed. They were stoned. Jesus said to the people of Israel in His time, look at your history. You killed the prophets. You stoned the people that were sent to you, and then they killed Him. And then He says to His disciples, they're going to hate you, they're going to kill you. And church history has gone like that, hasn't it? And we've had a bit of a respite in some parts of the world, not in all. I have a, a book that thick that I'm beginning to read on the persecution of Christians around the world now. There's always been this, and some kind of faddish attempt to appease the culture with music and some kind of soft-sell psychological message, is to betray the only responsibility, the primary responsibility we have, and that is to uphold the truth. So you have churches trying to find faddish entrees into the world, which become passé very soon, and the church itself becomes obsolete when new fads develop. Biblical Christianity says there is truth, and the truth is in the Word of God, and all necessary spiritual truth is contained here and nowhere else. Postmodernism says there is no absolute truth. Moral relativism says there is no authority. Personal freedom says there are no rules. And humanistic practical atheism says there is no judge. The Bible doesn't agree. The Bible says there is truth. There is an absolute authority. There are rules and there is a judge. And this is contrary to the world. That's where we are. That's where we're going to increasingly be. I guess in a, say, uh, in a sense I'm saying to you, get ready because we aren't going to change anything. I don't know what uh, the Lord has in store for us in, in the future in our world as true believers, but I think we're going to see churches... Um, trying to figure this out and end up compromising. We're going to see Christian leaders betraying the truth to avoid the hostility of the culture. We will not do that. And in the process, we will be, I pray, the most loving, gracious, compassionate, and tender-hearted purveyors of absolute truth anywhere on the planet, because they will know we're Christians by our what? By our love.